Welcome to First and Ten. I'm Josh Rodriguez. I'll be your host today. And college football WTF. Yeah, that's right. Why the face, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, wow. Unless you've lived under a rock as a college football fan, which I would think you would not have, you would have known that uh, Florida State got the absolute shaft of all shafts. That's right. Florida State went undefeated, and they did not get invited to the playoffs. They were ranked in the college football playoff rankings, the initial rankings, all the way up until the second to last. I think they're in the top four, and they were left out, and they were leapfrogged by Texas and Alabama. Uh, there's a lot that goes into that, but first, we're going to go ahead and do a rewind of the weekend. Let's start in the Pac-12. Um, we fell for the trap. The transitive property of college football. We told you to be careful. We saw Vegas, nine and a half point spread, everything, all the data, all the metrics looked Oregon, Oregon, Oregon as you go down. We were all sure. And I wish before my prediction show that I would have been watching everybody else's prediction show because I had a feeling that I was wrong before that game kicked off. And the, the feeling I got was the day of, I decided to go watch some prediction shows from other people, and it was just across the board, everybody was picking Oregon. And that's always a dangerous thing when that starts happening. Washington, on the other hand, did exactly what they always do, and they take that underdog role, and they came out, and they almost knocked Oregon out in the first quarter. That first half alone, like it was 20-3 to three all the way up until, what is it, about two minutes left in the half, and then Oregon came back, they scored the touchdown, made it 20-10 at halftime, came out after the break, scored, and then scored again. I can tell you that the way that that game started is exactly how, as a 10-point underdog, you want to play. Washington was hitting on all cylinders. Game plan-wise, so here's where we went wrong. Like One thing that I don't think I gave enough credit to, and a lot of people didn't, is Kalen DeBoer, Ryan Grubb, game planning. Just how good they came out in game plan. And specifically, we're talking matchups. They were able to expose all of the matchups in that game. So one of the telling plays of that game, to me, this is about of how good Penix is, how good Ryan Grubb is, of finding matchups. So they come out. It's it's third and ball game, right? Towards the end of the game, there's like less than two minutes left. They got to get a first down, and it's ball game over. And it's like third and five. So they call play. Evan Williams, they see, lined up on the slot receiver, I think was, I want to say that was Jalen Polk. And Evan Williams uh, is one of Oregon's weaker guys in coverage safety. He's got a cast on his hand. He's in off-man coverage. We've got five yards to go, and he's in off-man coverage. They see that, and it is the easiest pitch and catch five yards that, that you could imagine. So credit Ryan Grubb for putting him in that situation. Credit Michael Penix for seeing that matchup and knowing where he was going to go with that one, and then executing the play. That right there was something that I didn't see coming, was how good UW is when they need to be. They do everything they need to do. Maybe they don't blow teams out and they don't get all the style points, but you have got to be kidding yourself if you don't think this is one of the best four teams in college football, maybe the best. Um, they are really good on both sides of the ball, and they are timely at making plays. Let's move on to the Big 12, right and wrong. So we nailed it, right? We can't, well, kind of. We had Texas winning by 21. They won by 28, but there was a clear winner at halftime. You could see that Oklahoma State was doing everything they could to score a couple touchdowns in the first half just to keep it close. That whole game, Texas was never really threatened from the opening. So um, the defense is just really good. And it's amazing to me how we've talked about this a couple times on the show now, Like, and, and this is a continuous theme, actually, um, which was had stemmed from FSU and when Jordan Travis went down and how that affects the entire team. When Quinn Ewers went down in the middle of the season, Texas struggled. Right? And everybody's kind of like, what's wrong with Texas? What's wrong with Texas? What's wrong with Texas? Well, you know, everybody knew yours is out. That has a great effect on the defense. And that's just the sheer number of times that they're on the field, the number of plays that they have to defend. Everything goes into that when your offense isn't the same as it usually is. I feel like Texas, and we had predicted that they needed to go down and they needed to, they needed to win big in that Big 12 championship game, and they did exactly that. They left no doubt. There was no way they were getting jumped by Alabama. And they were healthy, reasonably healthy, we'll say. Obviously, when you lose an All-American running back, you're, you're not going to be healthy. But, again, running the ball, they're fine. You know, they just reload. C.J. Baxter, they've, got, they've just got guys. They've got guys. I think that is going to be an incredibly entertaining matchup between Washington and Texas. Good on Texas. Texas is, they're comparable a little bit to Oregon. 
um, as far as their defense goes. Remind me of it, and we'll see how that offense does. SEC, I'll say uh, about the only thing we got right was that Alabama was going to put up 24 points is what we said. They ended up putting up 27. What was underestimated? Underestimated Nick Saban's ability to motivate his team and to get his team ready for this. I underestimated um, Jalen Milrow and his ability to impact the game, even when he maybe he's not at his best passing. If you heard the Saban speech of the ultimate disrespect is when somebody takes something of yours and just motivating his team from within, that was, that was some seriously good coach talk coach speech. As far as this team goes for Nick Saban, I'm going to guess this has got to be right there with his best coaching jobs. He's the greatest coach of all time, and I think this is probably one of his best coaching jobs. This is not his most talented team. And parity at the top of college football is greater than it's been in a long time, I think, from a roster talent perspective. Nick went from really getting embarrassed, and it looked like they were left for dead after the Texas game, and then Jalen Milrow getting benched, looking bad against South Florida. And now they went in and they beat the almighty Georgia Bulldogs. Crazy, crazy. And they beat them in Atlanta, by the way, in Atlanta. It's not like this was really neutral. This game was as far as this is right, right in the Bulldogs' backyard. I think they favor uh, or match up favorably with Michigan. Um, I think that was a pretty good draw. If I'm Alabama, I'm pretty excited about the matchup that we have here. And so we'll get into Michigan here next. The Big Ten. I feel like we got this one mostly right. We overestimated Iowa's offense. We didn't know they were that bad. Or maybe we underestimated how good Michigan's defense is. Michigan's defense has answered the bell whenever it's needed to. Is Michigan's defense elite? I think we've seen enough to probably show that they have an elite defense. Both sides of the ball. J.J. McCarthy. One of the most accurate quarterbacks in college football. Really good. Iowa has one of the worst offenses in college football, yet one of the best defenses in college football. So think about that for a second. As we've been talking about, a team that cannot move the football, whose defense is always on the field, who plays in a really good conference, and they still have one of the best defenses in the country. They're on the field all the time. So how good could that Iowa defense actually be if they had an offense that was equally as good as that defense? That'd be scary, right? They probably are never going to get that or not anytime soon, but they definitely have a lot of room for improvement if they could figure out anything on the offensive side of the ball. Now with Michigan, everything that you would expect them to do in a championship game like this, 26 nothing. you know, it was a rock fight a little bit, but special teams looked good. Obviously they were never out of control in this game. They could have had a hangover from the Ohio State game, whatever it is. They're the number one seed going in. What's going to happen is they're going to have to out Alabama, Alabama. And I'm very much looking forward to that. And I'm sure Michigan is excited for this matchup. But this game is going to be decided in the trenches. That's one thing that we do know in that playoff. The ACC championship. We didn't think that the Florida State defense was going to be able to hold Louisville to six points. It made Plummer look pedestrian. The FSU defense rarely bent. I mean, 188 yards against Louisville. That's incredibly impressive, especially when you're only scoring 16 points on offense. FSU, maybe they didn't get invited to the playoffs. Maybe people, you know, don't think that they were a special team, but I can tell you they showed that they are the most galvanized team in college football. I can't think of another team that would get down to its third string quarterback and then go win a rivalry game away and then a conference championship game. So kudos to them, and they did it without one of the best players in America. That's how good that football team of Mike Norvell's is. I'm absolutely, you know, broken for these guys for for Florida State. College football. This is the biggest black eye that you could have. Mike Leach called this a long time ago. He said, this is not a playoff, right? I mean, this is, and a lot of people have said that this is an invitational, and this is exactly why. It's just when you have a team that does everything that they needed to do to get in, everything, everything they were asking, and ranked in the initial ranking, they, they're ranked. They moved all the way up inside of four, and all they did was win, 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 and then left out. That is just one of the toughest things to deal with and this will go down in in college football history and specifically because there was a precedence and the, the closest example is going to be Cardell Jones coming in Ohio State 2014 
go, they go and they play with Wisconsin. I think they beat them like 59 to six or something like that. And then they, they get into the playoff. Okay. So they had that chance though, to show in the conference championship game, just like Florida state and they won the conference championship game, but they did it with style. So it was style points. Florida state looked anemic on offense. Right, they held them to 188. I think they only had like 219 yards themselves, or 220 yards themselves, somewhere in that range. And so, for all intent and purposes, that was a, a defensive battle, another another rock fight, you know, as we like to call it. But either way, they still won with a third string quarterback. The only thing that we're left to draw from a conclusion like that is that that was 100 percent on the eye test. Anyway, I'm happy to be done with that. I'm happy that we get to a 12 team playoff this next year, and I'm sure you are too. The Sugar Bowl. My initial take, great game. Pete Kwiatkowski, I, hopefully I, I, I pronounced that. Anyway, co-defensive coordinator, Jeff Coyote. It, they're as good as you're going to find as far as coaching defense. As a matter of fact, Jeff was just named the head coach of Nevada Reno. And so he's going to coach in this game. He's going to coach through the playoffs. I think that's big for Texas, obviously, for cohesiveness, um, game planning. He's the inside linebackers coach. A lot of positives for them to have him there. But this defense of Texas is going to be tested. I told you they compared to Oregon very closely statistically in metrics, but also physical up front, good in the secondary. Um, you know, But the strength isn't necessarily the secondary. I got to do some more digging on how that secondary is going to deal with Washington because Washington, I, I think that's the best offensive coaching staff in the country. I think Ryan Grubb sits in the lab and he goes through and they figure out matchups, they figure out situations, and they just know what you're not comfortable doing. Sort of like a good defense makes a good offense uncomfortable. They make the defense uncomfortable and they know the situations that you're really not comfortable in and they figure those out and Penix is smart enough to see it I think pre-snap a lot of times he can kind of figure out where he's going to go with that ball based on what he's seen. So that's that's a tough combination to beat. Now, Washington, I could continue to go on, on about them. They've been in a lot of close games. This is going to be nothing new to these guys. Big stage, big game. They're like, bring it on. So that is going to be one hell of a matchup. All right, Rose Bowl, Michigan, Alabama. Okay, Michigan is the most distracted team in college football. Everybody knows this. Since Seingate, all the way through, Jim Harbaugh's three-game suspension. Now they get to the Big Ten Championship. They win. And this is hopefully in the rearview mirror for those guys. They may be peaking right now. We don't know. We don't actually know if they're peaking. We don't know how good they could be, which is a scary proposition. We know they're good up front. We know that they can run the ball when needed to. We know they can throw the ball. They seem like a very complete team. That is going to be tested. J.J. McCarthy is going to be tested. His accuracy is going to be tested against that Alabama secondary. That's Caleb Downs, Terrion Arnold, Kool-Aid McKinstry, assuming that he's cleared from concussion protocol. But either way, 11 passes defended for McKinstry, and you've just got some DBs that, that are long, they're physical, they know how to play, and the Alabama defense, those backers, they get downhill, a lot of good gap discipline. So it's going to be really interesting seeing Alabama against Michigan. Remember, Alabama was left for dead. They've kind of the poster child for resilience, and it's just a lot of really good stories here. But Jalen Milrow has shown me something, right? I was kind of eh on him, you know, even heading into championship week. But really, if you look at all the quarterbacks in the playoffs, he's the only true dual threat quarterback. Watch how they use him. Um, I'm going to be very interested. And again, as I said, he is a in short yardage and in the red zone. That's something to look at. New Year's Six Bowls. All right, so first one, the Orange Bowl. The line, Georgia by 14, and Johnny Wilson is out. So how will that affect that game? Probably significantly. Cotton Bowl. The line is Mizzou is one-and-a-half point favorite. Now, Ohio State opened as a favorite, and then Kyle McCord said, I'm not playing. He's in the portal now, so he's gone. And so Ohio State is now the underdog by a point and a half. We'll see how that plays out. The Peach Bowl. The line is Penn State. Three and a half point favorite over Ole Miss. Of course, uh, Kiffin, you know, is is so kind as to give love to Chop Robinson. Kiffin had uh, sent out a tweet that was, uh, you know, thanking him on a great career and, and also for not playing um, in this game. So now the Fiesta, the biggest one isn't somebody not playing, but the biggest news out of that one is that Bo Nix is playing. That is uh, is definitely significant for Oregon. So we'll get into predictions in a later show once we've kind of figured out all the movement and who's portaled, who's not, who's showing up 
and whatnot. In a nutshell, I think that this four-team playoff has been better than the BCS. And so all those national championships before that came before, you could throw them out. Now, schools, you're going to argue that, right, to death. And they'd be more relevant here in the four-team playoff than they were in the two-team selected playoff called the BCS, but definitely better than they were in the bowl game era, which made absolutely no sense at all in the way we picked a champion. So I've been for a 12-team playoff for a long time. And the reason that I've been for a 12-team playoff is I thought that the NFL model was a really good model to, to look at as far as the opportunity for lower-ranked teams to win. Now, the NFL is an 8-8 eight eight league. Like, if you look at their schedules, they try to get everybody on an even playing field from, from a roster perspective, the way that they do their draft, everything else in between is – it's about parity in the NFL. Now, college football is not quite like that. You've got the rich getting richer, the poor, some of them getting poorer. But at the top right now with NIL and the transfer portal, there is parity. More than there's been. The way that the rosters can move quickly and with NIL, I think the roster parity is greater than it's been. If you look at the NFL since 2005, all one and two seeds won from 1990, which is when they went to a 12-team playoff, until 2005. And between 2005 and 2023, you've had 10 one or two seeds. 10 times they've won the Super Bowl. Nine times they have not won the Super Bowl. That has been by a seed of three or lower. In terms of college football, that would be your fifth-ranked team down to your 12th-ranked team. Don't think that a 12th-ranked team can win? Well, the Steelers did it in 2005. They were a sixth seed. In 2010, the Packers did it as a sixth seed. This tells you that rankings aren't everything. Now, also of note is that in NFL, we have home field advantage, which I'm hoping they end up doing for college football. Hopefully the, that first round game, at least that first round game, is a home game. I can't imagine what we've missed these last however many years in college football, at least the last 10. Definitely this year, you could see a 12-team playoff being incredibly entertaining. But I'm also excited that we're moving out of this invitational era that we call a playoff, and we can get to real national championships starting next year. I'm not taking anything away from the schools that want it good on you. Like, I think that's great. I'm just excited now that there's going to be no doubt left. That's all I got for today. Thanks for watching. Smash that subscribe button. We like providing you a show with good information, quality data, and we appreciate your support. For First and Ten, Sports Idol Nation, I'm Josh Rodriguez, and we'll see you next week.